Like bedbugs, lice also cause itching. Lice belong to a group of parasites called ectoparasites. These are parasites that live on the outside of the host rather than on the inside. Lice are small parasitic insects, about 1 to 4 millimeters long, and they can be found on various parts of the human body. And because of that, they're called different types of lice. The three major types, head lice, and these are found in the head or hair, uh, body lice that are found in the body or on the body and on clothing, and crab and pubic lice that are found in the pubic area. They cause infestations such as pediculosis, that is really for head and body lice, and psoriasis for crab and pubic lice. They are actually not disease vectors, only body lice transmit disease or human disease. Both adult body and head lice look identical, so it's almost impossible to tell them apart. They are shaped like sesame seeds and they're anywhere from 2 to 4 millimeters long. They can vary from tan to grayish white in color and they do not have wings, so they cannot fly or jump, but they can crawl like bedbugs. The eggs are called nits, and they're not very large, just one millimeter long. However, they can be spotted quite easily, especially on dark colored hair, because they will appear like dandruff or specks of dandruff. Uh, even when they've hatched, the eggshells will still be stuck on the hair, and um, usually they cannot be removed unless they're combed out with a very fine tooth comb. And so they are a good sign that somebody has uh, infestation with lice. Depending on whether their head or body lice, the nits are deposit deposited either on the hair or clothing or fomites, as in the case of body lice. Adult lice can live for up to a month, and the females can lay a large number of eggs with head lice about 140 and with body lice even more, up to 300 eggs. And both male and female lice are able to bite, and they bite really to feed on blood uh, to give them nourishment. They will die if they are removed from the host after two days, so it's a good way to control them. I forgot to mention in the last slide that they undergo incomplete metamorphosis, so they don't have the larvae or pupae stage. And they're just like cockroaches and bedbugs where the nymphs will molt and then become adults. In the case of head lice, um, they are not known to transmit any human disease, as I've mentioned before. So most people who have head lice sometimes don't really know that they have the infestation, especially if it's very light. Some might have some itching um, if it's a very severe infestation and there are a lot of head lice moving around on the scalp. They can be found on the head um, as well as eyebrows and eyelashes, especially if the infestation is heavy. And But uh, lice usually will bite several times a day to get their blood meals. Because they are ubiquitous, so they're found worldwide, um, they're found generally in children, and the infestations are very common in children around the world. So head lice are transmitted mainly by direct contact, that is with the hair of an infested person, and this is usually close head-to-head -head contact. The condition pediculosis is diagnosed by finding live nymphs or adult lice on the scalp or in the hair. The nits usually, as I mentioned, can be seen quite clearly and so um, they can be used for diagnosis but you have to be careful because hair grows and so if they're found less than six millimeters from the scalp it is very likely that this is an active infestation but if they're found more than six millimeters from the scalp 
it probably is a previous infection in, infestation that has resolved. So in that case, treatment is not required. So head lice can be treated with over-the-counter or prescription medication. The medication should be used according to the instructions and clothing should be changed after every treatment. After 8 to 12 hours, hair should be combed with, remember I mentioned these fine tooth combs. Um, these are knit combs to really comb out any and remove any nits and eggs that might still be around because a lot of times the uh, the treatment doesn't kill the nits. And then to check for any life lice that might be uh, left behind. If the treatment fails, you need to really speak to the healthcare provider again and um, carry out the treatment again and continue checking for up to two to three weeks. If, again, if it fails, then it's necessary to treat again and ensure that all the lice are killed. There are various over-the-counter medication for treating head lice. They come in a variety of brand names like NYX, RNC, and Quilada. Basically, all of them are insecticide based. That is, they're either pyrethrins or the synthetic form, the pyrethroids, such as permethrin, at a 1% concentration. And they are only advisable for use in children older than two years of age. They will not kill the eggs, but only the live adult lice. So you have to treat again after 7 to 10 days to kill any newly hatched lice. There may be itching not due to a new reinfestation, but actually due to scalp irritation. So that should be taken into account if there's any itching present. There are also other medications for treating head lice. All of them are available in Canada and are chemicals at various concentrations. I won't read them out loud. However, because they have different age recommendations, their use will be limited to the age of the child or adult that requires the treatment. Like the pyrethrins, they need to be applied again after 7 days, as they only kill the adult lice and not the nits. So as always, especially in public health, prevention is always better than having to treat the condition. So to prevent head lice, it's always best to avoid head-to-head -head contact, avoid sharing any items such as clothing, especially hats, hair ribbons, and combs, and pillows, bedding, and stuffed toys. Any items that have been used by the infested, infested person should be washed in very hot water and also dried at high heat. This is not the time to actually conserve energy and use cold water washes and low heat drying because you want to really essentially kill all the lice and prevent the infestation from being transmitted to other people in the same family or in the same household. Any items that cannot be washed has, has to be sealed in plastic bags for up to two weeks so that the lice will die from not being able to feed. So now we come to body lice and these are very different because they actually affect a very different group of people. It's generally adults who are living rough or in shelter situations and they are not able to have good hygiene and not able to access washrooms. Human diseases that can be transmitted by body lice, remember head lice don't carry any diseases, while body lice are totally different, they do. Uh, diseases like Vagabond's disease, where skin sores can become infected, skin can become thickened after prolonged infestation. There are other diseases that are communicable ones, such as typhus, trench fever, and Lausbonne relapsing fever, all of which are bacterial diseases with different etiological agents. The human host is the only one that actually harbors body lice, and generally they're found 
not in the body of the person, but in their clothing, in the seams of the clothing especially, and also on fomites such as bedding. So what happens is that they move on to the body to feed and then they crawl back to the clothing. The lice are generally found all over the world. And as I mentioned before, they're mostly found in homeless populations where hygiene is poor or refugees that are living in very crowded conditions. As with head lice, body lice are also transmitted directly with contact between infested person and another person. But a little bit different to head lice is that there can be direct contact with clo the clothing and fomites that are used by the infested person. You don't really have to have direct contact with the actual person and you can still get body lice. So it's a little bit of a different form, but even with head lice, if you use, say, hats and ribbons, you could actually end up getting infested as well. So the diagnosis is actually looking for the nits and the lice in clothing, as well as looking for the lice themselves on, on the skin of the person. Treatment is really, um, in a way, not required with me medication. It really is more of a hygiene issue, where the person, if they change their clothing and have a, a, a bath or a shower, will actually eliminate the infestation. Um, the clothing should, and any bedding that they've used, should actually be washed again in a hot, hot cycle and then dried at high heat to make sure that all the lice are killed. Okay, now we've come to our last type of lice, and these are the pubic lice. You might have noticed that in some uh, sites that Theris pubis is not spelled with an H. I just thought of, it's just a new form of spelling, especially uh, American spelling, where somehow the H has gone missing and it's just been used uh, hands for. So we'll look at the morphology. You can see that crab lice or pubic lice are a little bit different to head and body lice. They're not the sesame seed shape. They're not elongated, but they're actually shorter and fatter. Um, and they look like, well, they're called crab lice because they look like crabs. Their appendages look like um, the, the, the legs that crabs have. You can see the claw-like um, appendages that they have. That's their feet. Um, and they're found mainly attached to pubic hairs, although sometimes if it's heavy infestation, they can be found in other parts of the body, such as the chest or even on the face, like the beard, eyebrows, and eyelashes. Pubic lice have the same life cycle as head and body lice in that they have incomplete metamorphosis and they don't have the pupae or larvae stage. They have uh, nymphs for the young, immature lice, and then these molt um, several times, and finally you have the mature adult. The lifespan is about a month, and the nits are generally found on the hair shaft. These are the eggs, so it's very similar to head lice. The adults, though, don't lay as many eggs, so it's only about 30. And both genders, the male and female lice, will bite uh, to get their blood meal and their nutrition. They don't survive for as long as head and body lice, about half the time, just a day. So in a way, that's good, but that's why they uh, tend to be transmitted from person to person through very close um, contact, especially sexual contact. Symptoms of pubic lice include itching, especially in the general area. There may be visible nits or crawling lice that uh, can be observed. But fortunately, pubic lice, like head lice, do not transmit any human disease. And their distribution, once again, is worldwide. They're considered sexually transmitted, especially um, with close contact between the person who's infested and somebody who isn't. And finding the lice and nits in the pubic areas uh, is a diagnostic feature. There are not that many that are usually present. 
and they're not as quick as head and body knives. They don't crawl as fast. So you can actually use magnifying glass to try and um, to, to look for them, especially if there's a suspicion that the person is infested with pubic lice. There are medications for treating pubic lice. They are the same medication as those used to treat head lice, but the um, the formulations may be, be a little bit different. They're usually shampoos or mousse. And you can wash the affected area and then after treatment, remove all the nits, that's the eggs, with a fine tooth comb or fingernails um, because they won't be killed by the medications generally, especially the pyrethrins or permethrins. The person should then change their clothing and any clothing, bedding or towels should be washed in the hot cycle and dry it also in the hot cycle. Any items that cannot be washed, just like for all the other types of lice, should be sealed for up to two weeks. And this is a little bit different in that contact tracing is required and then any contacts should be treated if they are infested. They should also avoid any sexual contact till the person has been treated successfully. As I mentioned before on the last slide, pubic lice can be treated with the same over-the-counter medication as head lice, and that is the pyrethrins or pyrethroids, like permethrin. There is also a second-line drug, which is sometimes used if the lice are resistant to permethrin or pyrethrins. And this is called lindane. It is quite toxic, so it's not generally used unless there is a resistance um, and it is only obtainable through prescriptions. Once again, you have to treat a second time after a week if um, lice is still present because the medications won't affect the nits. So to prevent transmission of pubic lice to other sexual contacts, it is important to examine all the contacts to see if they are infested and then to treat them as soon as possible if they are. Also to abstain from any sexual activities until everyone has cleared their infestations and to treat again if necessary, especially if the infestation is still present. All clothing and linens should be washed and dried in the same manner as during treatment, so the, um, the hot cycles and the hot washes are, are very necessary. Um, clothing and linens should not be shared, and sprays, fumigants, and foggers are actually not necessary because they're toxic, and you're actually spraying on clothing and on the body, so in a very vulnerable area, so this is um, something that should be avoided. It is also very proactive at this stage to look for other sexually transmitted infections such as um, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. So let's look at the first human disease that is transmitted by lice. This is typhus fever, not to be confused with typhoid fever, which is caused by Salmonella typhi, whereas typhus fever is caused by a bacteria called Rickettsia. There are three types of typhus fevers, all with different vectors. For this week, We'll look at the Lausborn one, which is epidemic Lausborn typhus, also known as ship typhus, because it killed many passengers on ships that used to bring immigrants over from Europe. Many of them were stuck a month or more in the lower passenger decks in crowded conditions and had no access to bathing or laundry facilities, and typhus outbreaks would be common, killing tens of thousands to the extent that the ships were called coffin ships. It was very tragic that so many never made it to Canada, or if they did, died during quarantine. There is also another type of epidemic typhus that is known as sylvatic epidemic typhus that is associated with flying squirrels. Your problem-based learning case this week is actually on the occurrence of this disease in a camp. So I hope you'll be able to read the paper and understand the transmission route of this other type of typhus. We'll cover endemic flea-borne typhus next week. 
because I don't think we'll have enough time to do it today. We won't be doing the last type of typhus, as it is not present in North America. Typhus is not a notifiable disease, so we don't have an accurate incidence rate for it, but the incidence is thought, thought to be low. Epidemic Lausborn typhus is caused by Rickettsia provazakii. The clinical symptoms include a sudden onset of headache, chills, fever, exhaustion, coughing, and severe muscular pain. These are very flu-like symptoms. However, what's different is that a rash can appear after five to six days, and it appears first on the trunk, the upper trunk, then the rest of the body, but it's not present on the face or the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet. The case fatality rate is as, can be as high as 40% in the absence of any treatment, that is, without the use of antibiotics. And there may be relapses years later. So this is actually the only Rickettsial disease that can cause explosive epidemics. This disease is transmitted between humans indirectly through exposure to the feces of body lice and not through their bites. What actually happens is that bacteria in the lice feces contaminate the site of the bite when scratching occurs. Also, infections may occur when lice feces or crushed dead lice are inhaled. Outbreaks have been reported in mountainous parts of the world where cooler temperatures result in infrequent laundering of clothing. Epidemic typhus also occurs in refugee and prison camps where overcrowding and poor hygiene is present. Occupations that are at risk of getting laos born typhus include humanitarian relief workers in overcrowded refugee camps. Good personal hygiene is essential to prevent disease transmission, as well as the use of powdered insecticides to control body lice and also to treat the clothing of individuals who are at risk. Rickettsia are obligate intracellular bacteria. This makes them quite unusual because most bacteria do not need to grow in cells, so they are more like viruses. Typhus can be diagnosed by immunofluorescence assays, which can be used to stain the bacteria present within infected cells, or by serology to detect antibodies to the bacteria, or nucleic acid tests that use the polymerase chain reaction to amplify up specific Rickett cell genes. If antibiotics are administered early in the infection, treatment is usually successful.